I've recently begun investigating the Eador games, and I started playing the newest one, Eador Imperium. The game is a lot of fun and has good necromancy, but is unfortunately quite buggy for a lot of people. I've personally experienced no bugs at all during at least 30 hours of playing, but I have had two crashes in that time. So bear that in mind if you decide to purchase the game. But it seems like the developers are still updating the game quite regularly. The last update was in August of this year. There's also an autosave feature on every turn, so there's no chance of you losing a save game due to a crash. So how this game works is you begin with a citadel, and depending on what buildings you build, and your decisions in the many little story events that occur throughout the game, you can develop positive or negative karma. This karma influences the kind of random events that occur in the provinces you capture. The game considers necromancy to be an evil act, so pursuing our path will accumulate bad karma. That's totally fine because all of the coolest stuff comes from the bad side anyway. I really like a lot of the evil karma units, barbarians, executioners, uh, dark mages, things like that. So it's really great in my opinion. So having to go for the evil karma with necromancy doesn't disturb me in the slightest. The buildings you can build are grouped into different categories. You've got the military quarter for training soldiers, the temple quarter for religious stuff, a merchant quarter for shops you can build. These shops sell equipment that you can equip your heroes with. The magic quarter for magic related buildings that can teach your heroes spells. There's also a bunch of other courses as well, and each of them shouldn't be neglected on your insane path for Supreme Necromancy. A Supreme Necromancer requires a strong economy, so I'd start off by building all the basic economy stuff, so you don't leave yourself vulnerable to attack. There's two quarters responsible for Necromancy in this game, the Magic Quarter and the Temple Quarter. Both are incredibly important for your Necromancy, but I'll begin with the Magic Quarter. To begin down the path of necromancy, you're going to need to build the Tier 1 Necromancy building, which is called the School of Necromancy. This provides you access to Tier 1 Necromancy spells, which your heroes can learn, and also paves the way to future necromancy structures in both the Magic Quarter and the Temple Quarter. The basic necromancy spells are Summon Skeleton, Summon Zombie, and Fear. Fear is a spell that terrifies an enemy unit and upsets their morale. Skeletons are fast and deal a lot of damage with their little sword, whereas zombies are slow and tanky. They can also disease the enemies of their strike, which is a really nice debuff. The worst thing about zombies is how slow they are. They're often only able to move a single tile at a time. Skeletons can usually move several tiles, but they don't survive very long in combat. Both minions can only be summoned from the corpse of a dead enemy. Now we come to heroes. You can hire a bunch of different heroes in this game, but Wizard is the best for necromancy. Wizards are also the only class capable of becoming a lich. Wizards are very efficient magic users, and require the fewest magic gems to conduct spells with. Another good option is the Sorceress. Her spells are more expensive to cast than the Wizards, and she requires more gems, but she is not required to learn magic in schools. Her spells come to her as she levels up. I'd recommend you'd first get a wizard, because the wizard is going to be your ultimate necromancer hero. You can later get heroes like the commander, who is capable of leading much larger armies than the wizard can. Or the legate, who can lead larger amounts of elite units. All your heroes are capable of basic necromancy, so you can send your commander, legate, warrior, or whatever else to the library to learn how to summon skeletons and zombies. Whatever units they summon will not exist beyond the current battle though. They also seem to be incapable of learning spells higher than tier 1, so they will never be able to summon advanced undead. The wizard and the sorceress on the other hand can get the necromancy skill. This makes necromancy cheaper to use, but it also allows the hero to keep whatever undead they summon after the battle is finished. This lets you use previously summoned undead in future battles. You want to get this skill as high as possible to make your necromancy as potent as it can be. I think the necromancy skill is also responsible for increasing the level of the minions you summon, which makes them a lot better. A skeleton summoned by a level 15 wizard is a totally different beast to the one summoned by a level 15 commander. In my game I went with the wizard and the commander, and very later on I got a legate but didn't really use her much. The wizard can only lead a very small army, so has to rely on casting spells which will cost you gems that you might otherwise want to use to create buildings with. 
whereas the commander leads a large army of regular troops, and these cost nothing but gold usually, so it's overall cheaper to use him for the trivial battles. Your wizard is better off kept for the harder battles, where he can be guaranteed to win with magic, but it's expensive because you're spending those precious gems. Another useful building is the Haunted Cemetery, a tier 1 magic quarter building. It allows you to recruit undead guards to your province. The undead guards are very cheap, costing only 40 gold to hire, and they're good defenders of a province, and they're also incorruptible. Enemies will not be able to bribe them because they're loyal minions. The only disadvantage of them is that they scare the populace, so you get a minus to the happiness of that province. But that doesn't matter much. If you neglect their happiness to the point where they start rebelling and rising up, it's good practice to your heroes anyway. They get to train by beating down your unruly citizens. There's actually a huge range of province guards that you can hire, and they've all got pros and cons. The most powerful guards are unlocked of high tier buildings like mercenary guards, or looted from dungeons by your heroes as one-off contracts. Here you can see the one-off contracts I found because they have a one next to them in brackets. The contracts without the one are ones that I've unlocked through a building, and I can use those again and again in whatever province says I want, but the caveat is that certain guards only like to work in certain types of province. For example, the tribe guard will only want to work in fields and open plains, and stuff like the forest guardians will only want to work in a forest. It'll take you a long time to finally be able to purchase your next necromancy building, the Necromancer's Guild, because you'll also be required to build three other tier one magic buildings. There's six buildings and you can only choose four. Some will provide evil karma once built, others are neutral and some are good. I chose the building for demonic summoning, which complements necromancy really well, as well as the illusion building and the elemental building. The two you don't choose become unavailable forever. You can only have four, so choose wisely. Although I barely used spells from the other schools, a few came in very handy. The haste spell allowed me to speed up an awfully slow zombie, and I also made occasional use of the elemental summons if my necromancy and demonic spells ran dry. The tier 2 necromancy spells are deadly terror, which causes turmoil, unhappiness, and unrest in the enemy province. It's a ritual spell, so not cast by the wizard during battle, instead it's cast from the map view. Along with that you get the ghoul summon, which is similar to a zombie, but improved in every way. The ghoul is fast and strong, and can devour corpses to regain health, and poisons and diseases the enemies that he attacks. It's a tier 2 unit, so it occupies a tier 2 army slot. The other two spells unlocked are disease, which is extremely useful. An enemy cursed with disease loses a decent chunk of HP every turn and has reduced attack and defense. It's extremely useful to soften up a tough enemy before they can reach your undead. The other spell is vampirism, which allows the unit to regain health when they inflict damage to the enemy. It's not bad, especially if you have a good unit on the brink of death and you need to heal them. It's also the only healing spell available to undead that I know of. The next step is tier 3 necromancy and the building for that is the Tower of Necromancy. To build it, you'll be required to specialize further. You'll need to have built the Tier 2 Necromancy Guild, along with two other Tier 2 Magic buildings. I chose the Demon Summoning building again, and the Elemental building, which stopped my progression in Illusion completely. You'll have to decide for yourself on what magic will complement your Necromancy the best. Once you have them, you can construct the structure and gain access to the following spells. The first spell is Raised Ghost. Ghosts are highly mobile and immune to most attacks, but they've only got 20 HP which makes them tougher than a skeleton, but weaker than a zombie in terms of hit points. But their ethereal-ness makes them invincible against lesser troops. When they kill an enemy, they restore some of their hit points. The Ghost is an extremely good minion, but it's expensive. It will cost you 40 gems and a handful of gems and upkeep. It's also a poor choice against magic users, you can destroy it quickly with magic. It's really best for use against lower level infantry because of its high resistance to physical attacks. The next spell is Mass Curse, which curses the entire battlefield with reduced attack and defense. It's honestly quite a good spell, and a cursed enemy will take a little bit more damage from your attacks 
and you will take a bit less damage from their attacks. In this game, every little bit counts, and cursing the entire battlefield like this is very useful. Finally, you get the Life Steal spell, which I've actually never used. It siphons health from the enemy to the caster. Finally, after a lot of spending, you'll get access to the final necromancy building in the Magic Quarter, the Necropolis. It grants you access to the following tier 4 spells. Pestilence, Raise Vampire, Mass Disease, and Cloud of Terror. Pestilence is a ritual spell to be used on the map against an enemy province. All units in this province have their HP halved, part of the population of the province dies, population mood is lowered, and growth decreases for 10 turns. This is a great spell to cast on an enemy province before invading it, especially if its defenses are strong. The next and best spell in my opinion is Summon Vampire. The Vampire is the ultimate undead unit because it has about 60 HP, which is a huge amount, and it can fly a huge distance avoiding all terrain and obstacles. It also hits like a truck and steals life with every strike. Once you have vampires, all the other units end up as basic meat shields to stop the enemy from reaching your wizard. The only other unit that can compete with the vampire in any level is the ghost. And while the ghost remains useful, it feels like a very weak version of the vampire. The next best spell after the vampire is Mass Disease. Casting Disease on one unit is strong, but casting Disease on the entire battlefield is insanely strong. Units will lose hit points every turn and be severely weakened. Casting this spell alone is enough to destroy low HP units like Tier 1 Archers and Spellcasters in just a few turns. It's also pretty cheap, but only costs you 15 gems, which is insanely efficient for the damage it causes. Stronger tier units will lose a significant chunk of their hit points and become fodder for your vampires and other undead units to tear apart. Cloud of Terror is a spell I haven't used, but it inflicts panic on the enemy in a large area. Tier 4 spell slots are very limited, and Summon Vampire and Mass Disease are simply too good, in my opinion, to sacrifice for the Cloud of Terror. Now we come to the Temple Quarter. As you've been progressing through the Magic Quarter, you'll have been unlocking some necromancy-based religious buildings in the Temple Quarter as well. The first of these is the Chapel of Eternal Rest. It doesn't do too much for you, but it does increase gem production, and any building which produces more gems is a building that you need. It also provides you with the Crystal Marrow spell, which is used to turn garrison skeletons into gems. The thing is, these skeletons are attracted to the Temple of Morgane, and any undead temple structure is considered a Temple of Morgane, as far as I understand it. And any province that has a fort built in it will slowly accumulate free skeleton defenders. At any time you can use this ritual to destroy them and turn them into gems. It's quite a good spell if you need a lot of gems in a quick burst. Next you get the Tier 2 Church of the All Deceased. It's quite a good building for your economy, and it's also going to yield you two spells. The first is Foul Waters, which will flood a desert province and turn it into a swamp. I'm not sure what advantage that provides a necromancer, because I haven't found any desert to test it on. The next is Lusts of Flesh, which turns some of your population in the province you target into a ghoul. This is handy to bolster your army's ranks occasionally. All of these divine rituals require favor of Morgain to perform. This seems to accumulate over time by itself. After you've built a lot of these different temple structures, you have a nice list of divine rituals to perform, and all of these rituals consume both standard magic gems, but also the favor of Morgain. Next we come to the Temple of Afterlife. This is an extremely important structure for us, because it grants us the ritual of Lichdom. The ritual is called Life Eternal. The other spell we get is called Procession of Souls, and if you cast this on an enemy province, ghosts will begin to attack the province. If the ghosts manage to defeat the defenders, the province is turned into an unaligned dead land. To perform the Life Eternal ritual and turn your wizard hero into a lich, you've got to bring him back to the capital. There must be enough room in the garrison for his army, 
So if your garrison is full of skeletons, assign them to another hero or get rid of them. There must also be enough room in the treasury for the wizard's items. Casting this spell will kill the wizard and he'll be reborn as a lich. Depending on the wizard's level, you get a different type of lich. I did the ritual to a level 15 wizard, so I received a greater lich. Later when my lich leveled up on his own to become level 20, he became an arch lich. So I assume a level 10 wizard would be a standard lich. The lich is much stronger than the wizard. You'll get a truckload more hit points, but all your spells and skills are reset. So any special spells you learnt from scrolls will be gone. Your lich will also have to visit the library and relearn the spells. His items can be retrieved from the treasury and you can equip them again. The lich can learn more spells than the wizard and also has a lot more army slots. So your lich can now lead an army. The only downside is the lich can only lead undead troops. So your living troops are no longer of any use to that hero. The higher your necromancy skill is, the more troops the lich can lead. So I'd recommend jacking it way up. So that more or less sums up the necromancy in Eodor Imperium. As you can probably tell, it's very satisfying necromancy. Actually, it's some of the best fun I've had in a necromancy game lately. The minions are plentiful, the minions are useful, minions are permanent, and lichdom is attainable. Your lich and your wizard especially should keep a low profile and stay in the back, buffing troops and debuffing enemies, because they're quite fragile, which I find nice. I really like the progression the game provides, it lets you progress from a lonely wizard who can barely cast any spells at all, and who can only summon a skeleton or two, into a mighty lich that can lead an army of them and destroy enemies of ease through mass cursing and mass disease. The other great thing about this game is that this game is superb for summoners as well as necromancers. You can summon demons as well as golems and things of that nature. I can't criticize much of anything in this game. I really like how the necromancy works. I think it will satisfy a lot of you, as long as you enjoy this type of game. I'm going to give this game a 9 out of 10, because it's quite superb and I really enjoyed playing the necromancy that they've provided. If you do run into stability issues with this game, you might want to refund it and try the older Eodor Genesis. I believe most of the gameplay systems are the same, it's just a step down graphically. But before you take my word for it, maybe wait until I review that game as well so that you can figure out for sure if the necromancy is the same or if it's similar, because at this stage I don't know yet. I've got to play it. But from a quick glance at the old game, it seems to be very similar to this one.